do I, oh, there I am. Hi, I'm Sachi Inari Rizzo, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Um, we have hold print room talks every other month. Um, the next one will be in June um, and the focus will be on Enrique Chagoya. And you'll have to check the website. Um, most likely will be in person, but there may be a virtual or digital component as well. Let me see. Off to the right, the this part. Uh, no, the the background leaves. Ah, that one. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's been a it's been a, a a little bit since I've done this, so <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, um, today we're going to talk about Elizabeth Murray and Jennifer Bartlett. Um, usually, I focus on a single artist, but I decided to co combine. Um, two different artists because um, they were um, about the same age. Um, they met at Mills College um, in California when Bartlett was an undergraduate. She was a senior, um, a senior, and Murray was um, in her first year of graduate school. Um, they both were finishing up their academic um, careers and beginning their professional um, work as artists around the same time, just prior to the feminist art movement, but neither one formally aligned themselves with the women's art movement. Um, they both made the covers of art news as we see here um, on the screen. Um, Elizabeth Murray made the cover in September of 1984 and Jennifer Bartlett made the cover in November of 1983. So that kind of just points to the level of um, national and international recognition that they both um, achieved. They were often in exhibitions together. They were represented by the same gallery, Paula Cooper Gallery. They both used recognizable imagery in their artwork, even when that wasn't necessarily very popular just prior to that. Um, and they were lifelong friends and supporters of one another. So first we have Elizabeth Murray on the left-hand side. She was born in Chicago in 1940. Um, her family then moved to Bloomington, Illinois, a much smaller um, community. Her high school art teacher provided a scholarship that en enabled Murray to go to the Art Institute of Chicago rather than staying close to home um, by attending Illinois State University. Uh, Murray first thought she would become a commercial artist possibly or possibly an art educator. Instead, she appreciated all the traditional training in the fine arts department that she received there at the Art Institute. She learned watercolor painting, painting the figure and landscape and developed an admiration for both historical and contemporary art. She received her BFA in 1962 and went to school with Chicago artists who later became the Harry Who, um, also known as the Chicago Imagists, um, including Jim Nutt and Gladys Nielsen, and all of whom um, were largely known for their use of figuration. Murray went on to Mills College, and it's a women's school in Oakland, California, and she received her MFA there um, in 1964. Murray admired the pop artists, such as Jim Dine, as we see on the left from our collection, and Klaus Oldenburg. Um, all working in the 1960s. She was attracted to pop culture imagery and found its cartoons, comic strips, and Disney an an animation appealing. She found comfort knowing that there were other artists legitimately concerned with recognizable objects. And at the time she was making sculptures, cutting up canvases and sewing them together and painting on them. I wish I had an image of that. I, have, I haven't seen her very early work. Um, but unfortunately, she was not happy with the work. A turning point for her was in 1971, when she realized she was trying really hard to be a vanguard artist, but was still dissatisfied with her work. She felt she had made a mistake giving up oil painting, so she returned to it. And um, by the late 1960s, minimalism had dominated the art scene, and um, it was known for its very stripped down um, geometric forms. Other art took on the form of performances, happenings, and especially conceptual art. So few artists were really interested in painting at the time, um, and few dealt with representational imagery. Um, she taught for two years in Buffalo and then left for New York City. And the word about painting um, that was going around on the streets, she recalled, haven't you heard? 
painting is dead. And she thought, oh, really? Well, what the hell with the hell? With, well, to hell with that. I'm painting anyways. Murray had married a sculptor she met in art school. And by 1969, they had a son. Her days were spent caring for the baby while trying to bring in money teaching art at the Dwight School. And that was a private school on the Upper East Side in New York. And so it was a difficult balancing act for her to teach, to be a parent and a wife, and then work on her own painting. And I found a wealth of um, ins installations, um, shots from her exhibitions throughout her career um, from the Paula Cooper Gallery. So we'll be seeing quite a few of those. Um, so this is an installation view from um, an early exhibition of hers from 1978. So she was one of the many artists at the end of the 70s who grew really disgruntled with minimal minimalism's coolness and began to interject emotion back into her work. Her shapes are a bit inflated, maybe biomorphic, and often described as cartoony. And this is a work in our collection. It's an untitled piece. Um, it was actually made for Lincoln Center's Mostly Mozart Festival in 1979. It's a six color silk screen or screen print um, and it was published by Lincoln Center. Um, the Lincoln Center still has a program, but by 1970, um, their posters and prints program began making premium limited edition prints to commemorate Lincoln Center's greatest of events. So in this case, um, it was the mostly Mozart festival. So artists like Chuck Close, Helen Frankenthaler, Barbara Kruger, Andy Warhol have all created silk screens sold to benefit education and the performance programs at Lincoln Center. And while this is a pretty common uh, practice now to have benefit print programs, this was pretty innovative at the time. Murray had some printmaking experience, but viewed this, this particular um, experience doing this print more like a poster. She said, you're drawing on acetate um, and there's a massive number of works, probably referring to the large number of, in the edition. Um, Murray's paintings of the late 1960s frequently depicted single forms. Um, this is from 1979. So her work in the early 70s, by contrast, became more imaginative, colorful, and formally abstract. She was painting biomorphic and geometric shapes with vibrant colors with a lively animated quality, which you can see easily conveyed here. Around the same time, the Whitney Museum of Art, American Art, exhibited her work in 1972 and 73. And that same year, her friend Jennifer Bartlett introduced her to Paula Cooper, who began to show her work at the art gallery. So we can compare our print with one of her paintings from around the same time. Um, it's the painting on the right is Children's Meeting um, from 1978, and it's in the collection of the Whitney. And so the shapes in the interior create a lot of movement, especially in both of these. And we have the contrast of these amoeba-like shapes with the angled lines. Uh, Murray enjoys variations on the surface. Um, she doesn't like a real smooth surface. If you look on the internet, there are a lot of great videos, um, either through Art21, through PBS, showing some um, um, filming Murray at work. So you can really see her you know, layering her paint. Um, she would scrape it and brush it. And so you kind of see that in the pink area of children's meetings here. We see it's not a really solid area of paint. And we see the same thing happening in the screen print that we own, the untitled one, where we see um, areas in which the ink from the layer beneath um, peeks through, especially in this purple area. Uh, Murray did create quite a few prints. We have a much more um, later in her career. She's working with Maurice Sanchez, I believe here. Um, she did have some early limited experience working in printmaking. She explained, I did lithography for a while when I was a student in Chicago. I loved drawing on the stone, but then I would have to print. And of course I couldn't do it. So I basically gave up. When she went out to Mills College for grad school, they gave her an assistantship and coincidentally, they needed an assistant in the printmaking department. And she said, I didn't know anything, but the guy who was the head of the printmaking class didn't want to do much. So he would show me a few perfunctory things and I would be left with these people, these students, and I tried very hard to pull their prints. Uh, Murray's other experience was during her first teaching job, which was in Buffalo. She taught five days a week and had to teach everything from drawing and painting to printmaking. And she said, 
I even started a printmaking department for them, which was ludicrous. I lied to get the job because I said I was a printmaker. They had all this money for a print department, so I really, really researched it and got these fantastic presses for them, a great litho press, a great etching press. I had all this incredible equipment I didn't know what to do with. Someone who knew something eventually helped me. Uh, Murray finally returned to printmaking in 1979 to create her um, most more serious prints. Um, although she has had a, a great career in printmaking, this has mainly been with the assistance of a master printer as such as Maurice Sanchez, as we see here. Um, this is another untitled lithograph that's in our collection. It's from 1980. Um, it was co-published by Brooke Alexander and the Paula Cooper Gallery, and it was printed by Daria Latois, which um, uh, Maurice Sanchez is a master printer there that we saw in the previous slide. So perhaps he collaborated with her on this print. And there are a lot of nice black areas if you um, see it in person. Um, it's fairly solid. There is some scraping to create these little, um, to get in between the shapes and the edges are really beautifully nice and messy. When Brooke Alexander approached her about making prints, she needed some convincing. She hadn't liked most of the prints she had seen for some time. She said, it seems like they're made, they're made about a painting, about something else. It's like copying some other kind of work to get something out. So for her instead, she determined, I saw doing the print to get really deep into the process of my own painting, to do something I can't do in a painting, I thought more in terms of the structure or the making of the print itself. And because I'm a historian, I, I have a lot of these installation views. So this is from a little bit later from 1981, again at the Paula Cooper Gallery. So we see while her works appear abstract, they're usually references to objects and rooms at this point. They're oddly irregularly shaped canvases of giant coffee cups or artist palettes brushes and splayed tables. In the 1980s, she began to paint on a larger scale. As we see here, canvases are irregularly shaped and layered, breaking it, breaking with the conventional flat rectangular picture plane. That's, which is much, a lot more traditional. These compositions became more energetic and forceful as Murray began to break apart her canvases, often sectioning them off into fragments. And here we have some at least in color, um, some examples. We have Yikes from the Museum of Modern Art and another um, a kitchen painting on the right-hand side that's in a private collection, both from the 1980s. Murray was very conscious of the terms ordinary or domestic and their implications. Um, she felt some critics had been patronizing about her subjects, calling them, quote, domestic imagery, suggesting that, tra that traditional women's work is a trivial subject. Murray's paintings of cups, for example, were commonly called teacups. And annoyed, she would say, it's as if the cups refer to a bunch of dainty ladies with nothing better to do than sit around and sip tea. And Murray was quick to point out that Paul Cezanne painted cups and, sauce, and saucers, saucers and apples, and no one ever, ever assumed he spent a lot of time in the kitchen. On the other hand, when she would paint the still life, some also felt she was making a feminist political statement about the home. This next one on the left is in our collection. It's entitled Down Dog. Um, it's a nine color lithograph. And it was made, um, it was published by the printmaking workshop ULAE. Um, she also did another piece, Open uh, Up, Dog as well, Up Dog as well, which is on the right. Um, she used litho crayon to build up really nice tonal areas um, to a rich density of color. Um, and this, this, What's nice about um, this uh, direct handwork, it's possible with lithography. And we can see the contrast between the density of down dog on the left versus kind of an open, openness, a light, lighter quality of up dog. So by 1988, the same year she made down dog, Murray was an honored with a retrospective that toured the country before closing at the Whitney Museum of American Art. We have one, an image, nice um, archival photo of Murray at work with down, down dog and up dog, up dog on the wall. It may be difficult to tell, but down dog is not pre 
print it on a rectangular sheet of paper, you can kind of see that it's very irregular. Um, she pushed the boundaries of the traditional format for printmaking on a rectangular sheet of paper. Rather, the print parallels her shaped fragmentary canvases and drawings. So in her drawing, she would, she would glue torn paper shapes as the drawing progressed. And Bill Goldston at ULAE had asked Murray, how can you make flat prints after working on three-dimensional canvas? And he said she looked at him and kind of smiled and proceeded to show him a flat drawing stapled to the wall on several pieces of paper as an, as an idea for her next print. That was how she worked on drawings, by stapling pieces of paper on top of each other and drawing another layer until the drawing was finished. And I have some close-ups of down dogs. So you can kind of see how it, it is very irregular. Um, in down dog, all the segments were then torn into different triangular shapes and attached together with Japanese paper hinges. Where two or three plates overlap, so did two or three sheets of paper. And so when we think of um, shaped paintings, the artist Frank Stella and his work may come to mind. Um, however, even with an eccentrically shaped canvas with Stella, the borders generally determine the placement of the stripes um, inside. And so we have an example of Frank Stella's um, printed work on the, right, on the left hand side with one from our collection, Union, and then also from um, 10 years earlier, um, Frank Stella's exhibition at the Leo Castelli Gallery in 1964. So we can see his um, shaped canvases and how the um, interior lines echo the, the perimeter. And here we have installation views of two exhibitions, Frank Stella's metal release from 1975 on the right-hand side from the Leo Castelli Gallery, and then a paintings and drawings um, exhibition again at the Paula Cooper Gallery, but in 1987. Um, and Murray had said, had made a comment about Frank Stella and the comparison between their work. She said, then there was Frank Stella. I saw the exhibition at Leo Castelli's in 1975, where he showed the, those first steel things with the paint on them. And I thought they were fantastic and really wild, but I already had a competitive thing because I was starting to think about working with shapes and people were comparing some of his, my shapes to his. And I thought my painting had nothing to do with what he was doing. So it was hard for me to let myself get totally into them. And so you can kind of see the comparisons between the two and the, the um, Frank Stella exhibition does seem to be the one she's referencing. Um, by the 1980s, Murray's works were growing in scale to about 10 by 10 feet. And you can kind of get a sense of that in the um, installation shot of her exhibition. The canvases undulated in relief from the walls, the edges curled. Um, in some ways, Murray blurred the line between painting as an object and painting as a space for, depic for depicting objects. And we have one last work in our collection by Murray. It's entitled The Clock, and this is from 1993. It's also from the Lincoln Center print program. Murray said she was simultaneously trying not to have an image and yet have an image. In answer to why she broke apart her paintings into interlocking pieces, she said, I like to paint edges. Again, regarding the comparison with Frank Stella's sculptural paintings, as in the clock, um, her subjects were always up from daily life. Shoes, or broken coffee cups, telephones and tables and cats, and Stella's works allude to great literature and avoid the personal. So um, this is a later photo of Elizabeth Murray. Um, I found some comments, a comment by Jennifer Bartlett, her friend. She said, Elizabeth was the first woman I'd met who was as ambitious as any of the men I knew. She worked constantly, wouldn't go for meals and lived on grape nuts. She was a real artist to me. And um, attesting to their friendship, Bartlett wrote, even wrote a tribute to her friend for the American Academy of the Arts and Letters when she passed away from complications from lung cancer in 2007. And here we have Jennifer Bartlett on the right. Um, she was born in 1941 and grew up in Long Beach, California. At age five, she said she already told her parents she wanted to be an artist. 
Um, in high school, she was astounded by the work of Vincent Van Gogh when she saw an exhibition of his paintings. And like I mentioned earlier, she attended Mills College with Murray where she received her BA in 1963. She attended Yale School of Art where she received her BFA in 1964 and, and an MFA in 1965. And at Yale, she um, met, was among a large community of artists people like Jonathan Borofsky, Richard Serra, Nancy Graves, and some of her um, schoolmates, her um, the, uh, fellow students are in our collection. We have examples of, on the upper left, um, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold, a nice pastel landscape. Um, next to her is a self-portrait by Chuck Close. Um, to the right is a very aggressive um, abstract mark do common by Frank uh, Richard Sarah. Um, bottom left, she went to school with Joel Shapiro, and then on the bottom right is Nancy Graves. She studied under Jack Torkov, Al Hell, James Rosequist, and Jim Dine. Um, so even though Yale's program was said to have been fairly conservative, they brought in numerous um, working artists um, um, from New York City that wasn't too far away. She studied uh, after marrying medical student Ed Bartlett in 1964, she shuttled back and forth between New York and Connecticut where she taught at University of Connecticut. And after she divorced in 1972, she moved to New York permanently and taught at the School of Visual Arts. Um, her watershed work that's truly very epic is Rhapsody. It's from 1975 to 76. It's owned by the Museum of Modern Art. And we see only a part of its installation here on the, on the right side. It consists of 987 baked enamel steel plates. The work spans over 150 feet and is seven and a half feet tall. Yet it still maintains an intimate quality with the viewer because of the individual parts. Um, when it was first exhibited, it took up the entire gallery space at pa the Paula Cooper Gallery. So around the same time in 1978, Bartlett's work was included in the Whitney Museum of American Arts seminal group exhibition, New Image Painting. Pop artists, including James Rosenquist, um, were visiting artists while she was at Yale. She reminisced later that Rosenquist's works in the 1960s went beyond the traditional notice of notion of paintings. So F111 we see on the right-hand side, um, it's shown at the Leo Castelli Gallery, was extremely large in scale. Um, it was pretty much um, became more of an installation, more of an immersive experience. Rosenquist's painting was made of 23 sections of 59 interlocking panels and spanned 86 feet. At that late length, it even went around corners, which is something we see happening in Jennifer Bartlett's um, work, Rhapsody. Here's another portion of Rhapsody. Um, so it was all done on one foot square, 16 gauge steel panels, um, somewhat reminiscent of flooring tiles. The panels were covered with a baked white enamel surface. And previously she had tried wood and plastic and aluminum, um, but Bartlett was influenced by subway station signs. Um, the steel plates were often used in commercial advertisements and company logos. And Bartlett said, they look like hard paper. I needed hard paper that could be cleaned and reworked. I wanted a unit that could go around corners on the wall, stack for shipping. If you made a painting and wanted it to be longer, you could add plates. If you didn't like the middle, you could remove it, clean it, replace it or not. And here's another view of Rhapsody on the left and then works by Saul LeWitt and Carl Andre, um, some of her contemporaries and artists working just, you know, in, in the 1960s prior to her career, her career. Like some of her contemporaries and predecessors, particularly the minimalist, Bartlett's enamel plate work was guided by geometry, rules and serialism. The grid work is often compared with the grid-based work of Carl Andre and Saul LeWitt. Artists like Saul LeWitt worked within systems and in serial form. So for LeWitt, the process was the subject matter. He reduced his works to a few basic shapes, whether it be tri tri uh, triangles, quadrilaterals, or spheres, and used a limited palette, you know, whether it's black, white, yellow, blue, or blue. 
Lewick um, described conceptual art as arising when the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. And, so, and for someone like him, all of the planning and decision-making was done beforehand. Bartlett would have, would have had the enamel panel silkscreen with grids. In the enamel plate work, she might limit herself to certain types of paints and range of colors, all applied within the grid. And yet she might introduce chance like the um, artist and musician John Cage to de determine the placement of her marks. <coughs> Here's yet another um, installation view of Rhapsody. Um, but however, the final result, that is the painting was still very important to Bartlett. Um, the rules that guided her work was just the process. So Bartlett set rules for Rhapsody. She had 11 separate themes, used 25 separate colors. And she didn't use traditional oil paints because of the um, steel plates. She used commercial testers, enamel paints. Um, they were vibrant, unmixed hues, not and something not typically used in the fine arts, but rather for painting, model toys, um, things used by hobbyists. And her friend Elizabeth Murray observed and said, you've always been interested in telling a story with your work. In the early pieces, the story evolved from puzzles or problems you set for yourself. And throughout Rhapsody, Bartlett used representational imagery, but in a new way. She limited it to a small number of figurative elements to represent land, water, sky. Her motifs included the mountain house, which we see over here, the house motif, tree and ocean, they weren't presented naturalistically, but rather more like symbols. And this might look familiar to some people who've been longtime um, visitors to the museum. These are installation shots from September of 1988 for, for the exhibition Earthly Delights, Garden Imagery and Contemporary Art. Um, and it consisted of 24 contemporary artists using the garden as a source of inspiration with all its associations, including the Garden of Eden um, as paradise. The exhibition included 16 drawings from Bartlett series in, entitled In the Garden. And this series was born out of a comedy of expectations, not, not necessarily errors. And we have some of Bartlett's um, drawings over here on the left-hand side. And this is the work that we purchased out of the exhibition in the garden number 51 from 1980. Um, and it's an oil pastel. So in the winter of 1979, um, going into 1980, Bartlett rented a villa in Nice to work on her unpublished book entitled The History of the Universe. She had never been to Southern France and her expectations was for sun and empty beaches However, it rained nearly every day and it was cold and damp in the villa. She said, I was raised in Long Beach, California and I didn't have to come 7,000 miles to see this. But in the dining room, looking out the window, she could see the garden that featured an empty tiled swimming pool, a statue of a boy, a cypress tree border, an olive tree, an orange tree, um, some peonies and some garden furniture. She needed a portable art form. So Bartlett bought a supply of paper all measuring 19 and a half by 26 inches and some drawing materials, some pencils, colored pencils, pen and ink, Conte crayon, charcoal pastel, oil pastel as in ours, our work, watercolors, gouache and brushes. So here's an installation view of her drawings exhibition for the Paula Cooper gallery that um, was the result of her stay. She completely immersed herself and over 15 months, she completed close to 200 drawings. Taken as a whole in the garden is a systematic, not is systematic, not improvisational. However, the drawings were done in a multitude of artistic styles, which is something that we can see in our own. Um, let me go to that one again. Um, so we can see that she's done, taken a more naturalistic approach on the left-hand side versus a more um, linear sketch, very much more abstract on the right-hand side. The drawings varied in weather and light conditions and vantage points. They were created in a combination of on-site from memory and photographs. So in the exhibition at the Paula Cooper Gallery, the drawings um, altogether took on an effect of an installation in itself because 
there were so many, there were 200 works. And in the grouping of the drawings of the same subject, Bartlett again formed a grid, uh, a motif echoed in the actual tiles of the, the garden pool. So Bartlett showed an interest in the marking of, in the passage of time, and this is appropriate. Um, she was doing this in France. <coughs> She was open to the effects of cha <coughs> chance in subject matter or process. The garden ha had such a hold on her imagination that she looked on the subject again. <coughs> Excuse me. For a 1980 commission for the Institute of Scientific Information in, <coughs> in Philadelphia in numerous single and multi-panel paintings. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we have another work by Bartlett in the collection. It's entitled Autumn from the Four Seasons. Um, it's a 60 color screen print. Um, and as I mentioned, it comes from a series. And on the right hand side, <clears throat> we have examples of the other um, seasons in the, in the series. <coughs> So the passage of time is explored further, um, even beyond the, in the garden um, in this series. And it's a, a time honored theme in art. Typically artists explore the cyclical aspect of nature that parallels also the human experience. Um, this is often seen in the cycle of birth, growth and maturation, aging and death, and then going back again to regeneration and renewal. <clears throat> And this is usually seen in the use of flowers and the seasons. <clears throat> so in a sense, the formal garden is a futile means for humans to exert control and um, put order in nature. Bartlett subverts the theme of regeneration by making death the focus throughout the, the entire series. We see, um, we kind of see the skeleton in all four of the, the works here. Um, Bartlett sometimes uses the element of chance as a working method, <clears throat> but the literal images of playing cards and dominoes are representative of chance as well, which is pretty much in opposition to nature's predictable cycle. And we can see the dominoes here and deck of cards. Her motifs aren't symbols. <coughs> Bartlett says, there is the subject matter and then there is the content of the painting and the subject matter is a device, it's a starting place. The content is something different. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Here the subject matter is the seasons and the number of disparate objects that find their way into the paintings. The content is the way in which they are painting. So for Bartlett, the seasons are about marking time. It's as if you walked into a story for which you must imagine the beginning and the end, but it's a story though that is non-linear. Um, <clears throat> the series arose out of a commission for a department stores. She worked from the paintings to make the prints, but she didn't try to reproduce them. She went back to the original source materials and made changes in scale and technique. Oops. And I included one other um, uh, series of works by Jasper Johns. Um, it's the Four Seasons, just to let you know that other contemporary artists were kind of using and playing with the same um, themes as well. And then our last work by Jennifer Bartlett in the collection is Houses, Dots, Hatches from 1999. It's also a screen print. Um, we see Bartlett returning to the simple, almost pictographic image of the house made up of a sim simple triangle on top of a rectangle. It is a motif she's been repeatedly returning to since the 1970s. Um, we saw that earlier in Rhapsody, which is on the right-hand side again. She painted a series of houses in 90, 1976 to 78 with all the same shapes. It's kind of like a universal symbol for her communicating a home. They often took on personal significance by making them into representations of family and friends. Bartlett had commented what is more common, a more common image in the USA than 
that everyone would recognize than, than basically a house. And this uh, cell screen is made up of 23 colors. So that would be 23 different screens used to make up this, this um, screen print. We see a grid-like structure of dots, which are regular in character and hatch marks that are in contrast, more unplanned and randomly placed. Here's a much later photo of Bartlett. <clears throat> Her work is still the subject of many exhibitions, including some for later even this spring at the Paula Cooper Gallery. And attesting to their friendship, there's a nice interview with Murray um, questioning Bartlett in Bomb Magazine from fall of 2005, which is on the internet. <coughs> and also if you're around the museum, you're welcome come in, to come in. I have books on both the artists. And, and because I am coughing a lot, I think I will end it right now, <laughs> but I hope to see you soon.